Now on to Horizon Special, examine space exploration on and beyond the moon. on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. In July 1969, Apollo 11 lifted off here at Cape Canaveral to take two Americans to the surface of the moon and back, ahead of John Kennedy's already ambitious schedule. Fifteen years later, in the knowledge that the President's prime aim was to find anything that would take the public's mind off his recent political humiliation at the Bay of Pigs and win some kind of propaganda victory over the Russians, the idea of a manned mission to the moon seems an outrageous leap of the political imagination but it paid off. The landing in the Sea of Tranquility was a crowning moment in the history of mankind. It united the world as never before or since. And it was all American. The first part of this program tells the story of that moment as recorded by the onboard cameras and as we all saw it back here on Earth. Today, though, that first moon landing is more than just a great adventure story to be retold. It has particular relevance because, in many ways, it's about to be repeated. After a decade of relative inactivity, we are about to take another great leap for mankind. So the second part of this film, then, explores the missions that are planned as part of that leap. They're wide-ranging and ambitious, and perhaps more clearly appreciated in the light of what happened in that extraordinary week that began here on the morning of July the 16th, 1969. because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. we've come to expect, and I think it's really rather staggering, you know, to remember the first men in the moon are really on their way.
estimated world television audience of 600 million people this afternoon watched the Apollo 11 spacecraft launched into a perfect blue sky above Cape Kennedy in Florida. On the first stage of its four-day journey to the moon, 724 milliseconds late. At this moment, the three astronauts on board, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, are nearly 11,000 miles out from Earth, going towards the moon at a speed of over 11,000 miles an hour and slowing as they go because Earth's gravity is trying to pull back all the time. I've got the morning news here if you're interested, over. Yeah, we sure are. We're ready to copy and comment. Okay, uh, first off, it uh, looks like it's going to be impossible to get away from the fact that uh, you guys are dominating all the news back here in Earth. Even uh, Pravda in Russia is headlining the mission and calls Neil the czar of the ship. I, uh, I think maybe they got the wrong mission. 11, this is Houston. We're getting a good picture of Buzz now. We've come to the conclusion that this has been far more than three men on a voyage to the moon. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. The acceptance of this challenge was inevitable. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? There is a great deal of interest here in the flight of Apollo 11. The half million American servicemen on duty in South Vietnam have been reading about it for weeks in Stars and Stripes, the daily military newspaper, and in several of the English language Saigon papers. Well, it really didn't impress me too much until today when I was talking to a former Viet Cong who works for my company. I was talking to him through an interpreter, and we were trying to explain to him the United States is putting a man on the moon. And as much as we explained to him, he just refused to believe it was possible. And it really hit home at this time that the United States is accomplishing a fantastic feat. And, uh, you're doing practically the same amount of speed you are. Uh, seven, take that guy at 12 o'clock. Uh, about three miles. Uh, seven, take your, you're just about to merge with that boy. For space science has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. Whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. And any second now we should hear Eagle. They have it. They have acquisition uh, signal. They've picked up the lunar module with Armstrong and Aldrin on their way down to the moon. So let me shut up and let's just listen to this drop towards the lunar surface by Eagle, the lunar module. Eagle, Houston, we rig you now. You're a go for PDI. Over. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. Roger. Okay. Confirm. Okay. Does it converge? Oh, it's beautiful. Does it converge? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, all flight controllers, go now, go for landing. Retro. Go. Righto. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. 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 Well, this is the moment, if there ever was a moment, for Patrick Moore. Well, I really feel absolutely overcome. I've lived with this idea all my life. Now that it's really happened, I can hardly believe it. No admiration can be too great for those magnificent men who have brought this strange spidery module down on the moon. And this obviously is a moment that humanity is never going to forget. And here's the picture. And we're getting a picture on the TV. TV. Oh, you got a good picture, huh? Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and uh, currently it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out uh, a fair amount of detail. There is Armstrong. You can see him moving. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the lamb footpads are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. I'm going to step off the lamb now. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. There's Aldrin. Armstrong's going to try and guide Aldrin out as he comes backwards. How far are my feet from here? Okay, you're right at the edge of the porch. Making sure not to lock it on my way out. <laughs> there you go. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent sight out here. Magnificent desolation. Okay, Houston, I'm going to change lenses on you. Uh, Roger, Neil. There's a moment while Neil Armstrong changes the lens on the television camera. When he takes it out to its distant position, we'll get a wide view of everything that's going on. 20, 50 feet, why don't you turn around and let, uh, let them get a view from there and uh, okay. see what the field of view looks like. Back the cable. There it is. The lunar module. I'll get a couple panoramas with it, sir. Uh, you're going too fast on the panorama sweep. You're going to have to stop for... I haven't stopped. I haven't set it down yet. That's the first picture in the panorama. Right there. Roger. The sea of tranquility. Okay, I'm going to move it. Okay, there's another good one. The blackness of the sky. Okay, we got that one. Roger, we see Buzz going about his work. How's that for a final uh... Okay, that looks good there, Neil. And we've just heard that all over the world there are 33 countries who have stayed up to take these pictures live. This 
is CBS News color coverage of Man on the Moon. This evening, a walk on the moon. Now here again is Walter Cronkite. Well, for thousands of years now, it's been man's dream to walk on the moon. Right now, after seeing it happen, knowing that it happened, it still seems like a dream. Let's go now to Mike Wallace in our CBS News Space Headquarters in London for a report on the world reaction to this event today. Mike? The headline of the Daily Mirror here tells it all for London. Let me read it. The date, July 21, A.D. 1969, man walks on the moon. Astronaut Neil Armstrong launched a new era for mankind today when he stepped from the lunar module. America, a land of frontiersmen, has launched a new frontier. All of the newspapers here, of course, have given banner headlines to the story. And on the television channels, all of them this morning, they are replaying the tapes of the astronauts' walk on the moon. But of course, there is no sense of holiday here. It is a working Monday morning, but it seems that everybody you talk to in London watch television all night through. And of course, there is nothing but admiration for Armstrong and Aldrin. I suppose it's an achievement which incorporates all the work, all the discoveries of the mathematicians and the scientists and the space experts, almost from the earliest days of mathematics and science and incorporates the technologies and the experience of many nations. And now, I think, our greatest feeling of all is our prayers for the safe return of these three very great men. Now, for those of you who have just tuned in, one of the astronauts walking on the surface of the moon. And here comes Mike Collins, 70 miles up in the command module. Arthur, uh, you've been dreaming of this moment long before many of us did, beginning back in the mid-1930s. You were writing about going out to the moon. What was your feeling when we saw this thing happen today? Well, I don't think I did feel anything. I think we all sort of, the time just stopped for me, and I think it stopped for everybody. It was just a, a hole in history, you know, and every, the whole world, everything, my heart stopped. Breathing stopped. I can't imagine a moment to, to, to equal this. Uh, the only thing I could imagine is if some fellow came forward and could say positively, we're not going to have any more war. I think this is a step in that direction because this sort of thing is making our stupidities here on Earth seem more and more intolerable. And I think this may be the greatest result of the space program. Come in, Mr. Heinlein. I agree with what Arthur said a while ago about the possible effect on war on this planet, but I think this whole business today, this week, has been thought of in many cases in too small terms. This is the greatest event in all the history of the human race up to this time. This is, today is New Year's Day of the year one. If we don't change the calendar, historians will do so. The human race will not die. Even if we spoil this planet, the human race will not die. It's going to go on and on and on. But those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon. It came in peace for all mankind. July 1969, 50. Uh, Roger, our guidance recommendation is you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Port stage, engine arm ascent, proceed. Beautiful. 26, 36 feet per second up. Very smooth. Very quiet ride. There's that one crater out of there. Thousand feet high, 80 feet uh, per second, vertical rise. Eagle Houston, to request manual start over right.
we can do all of that in such a short time, I wonder why it is that uh, we can't uh, put that same effort to bring good and peace to all the world. There's blackout. Range to go to splash 1,510 nautical miles. Back on Earth, all that remained of the vision was this, the image of Buzz Aldrin standing in the lunar dust. Unfortunately, the photograph also showed the American taxpayer where his dollars had gone, and he didn't like the view. The Apollo project was curtailed in the face of public disinterest and hurried, some said, to an early grave. Today, 15 years later, in a lifetime in politics, comes the Renaissance. The idea of a space spectacular has been disinterred, largely thanks to this. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Good roll confirmed by mission control. This year, the shuttle will carry more astronauts into orbit than flew during all the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab missions combined. Over 40 shuttle flights are planned during the next three years. Challenger Houston, your go at throttle up. Challenger Houston. Aside from present problems with the latest orbiter, Discovery, NASA's shuttles are poised to provide regular access to space and the means to develop a spectacular technology to exploit the new frontier.
Candlas and his manned maneuvering unit uh, constitute a separate spacecraft of their own now. Fifteen years after Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon, there is now a new image of man in space. And almost 25 years after Kennedy set the lunar goal, President Reagan has echoed the initiative in setting America a new major objective in space. America has always been greatest when we dared to be great. We can reach for greatness again. We can follow our dreams to distant stars, living and working in space for peaceful economic and scientific gain. Tonight, I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. The dream of a space station is hardly new. A hundred years ago, science fiction writers had ambitious visions of cities in the sky, where armies of astronauts would assemble vast spinning structures, creating a comfortable environment for thousands of people miles above the Earth. Such a station would be a stepping stone, a place of departure for all points in the solar system. But what President Reagan is proposing is a long way from that grand vision. At least for the foreseeable future, NASA's space station will be a more modest affair. It will be assembled in several stages from components delivered into orbit by the shuttle. In the largest designs, there will be room for a crew of six to eight astronauts. There may also be unmanned sections of the station flying separately alongside. The man in charge of NASA's space station task force is John Hodge, British-born and a veteran from the earliest days of the space program. This particular piece you see here is the manned part of the program. We also have associated with it uh, unmanned platforms which wouldn't have the, the manned elements on it. But let me tell you a little bit about what we've got here as a result of that, recognizing that it may not look anything like this by the time we build it. Uh, of course we have the shuttle, um, which you've all seen many times. And it has the uh, robot arm here which uh, is able to pick things up and will be able to place them on the space station. Uh, this piece down the end here is the servicing platform where we will bring other satellites in and, and repair them. Now on the end here what we have is just simply a number of, a representation of a number of modules where various things would take place. You'll notice that this one has Japan written on it and this one has uh, uh, European Space Agency and there's a couple of US ones here. We do expect this to be very much an international program but we could conceptually say that this is the uh, the habitat where the men will live, and we'll have from six to eight people uh, living there continuously. John Hodge and his team are far from decided how the space station should finally look, or exactly how their eight billion dollar budget will be spent. Every major aerospace company in America is churning out designs, hoping for a piece of the action. We expect to get going uh, early next year on the detailed design, and then following that in 1987, or perhaps a little bit later than that, we'll actually start cutting metal. So we really won't have anything to launch until the early 1990s, and we expect this facility, for example, to go up with about five shuttle launches over a period of about a year. So it would be, say, 1992 or 1993 before we actually had a fully functional space station. But once the space station is in orbit, what will it be good for? Well, according to NASA and President Reagan, practical rewards will rain down from the heavens. The benefits to be reaped from our work in space literally dazzle the imagination. Together, we can produce rare, life-saving medicines, saving thousands of lives and hundreds of millions of dollars. We can manufacture super chips that improve our competitive position in the world computer market. We can rapidly and efficiently repair defective satellites. We can build space observatories, enabling scientists to see out to the edge of the universe. And we can produce special alloys and biological materials that benefit greatly from a zero gravity environment. Commercialization is the new buzzword in space. Freed from the influence of Earth's gravity, many industrial processes work more efficiently in weightlessness. The dream is that profits from products made in space 
may ultimately pay for the space station. The idea of uh, making money out of going into space, of course, is uh, something that people have dreamed about, but we're never very sure it was going to happen. And here we have now the communication satellite business, which was sort of described and invented by Arthur Clarke in 1945, uh, being perhaps the large the fastest growing industry we've got. Enormous amounts of money being made and tremendous technological advances uh, for people. But there are other things that we can do, uh, uh, particularly to take advantage of the zero gravity and the very high vacuum. Uh, and as a result of that, we've seen the, the recent work that uh, McDonnell Douglas and Johnson & Johnson have been doing in separating pharmaceuticals. Uh, they are very, very high value. Uh, uh, substances and uh, and it does pay to go into orbit to do them because we can increase the rate of productivity by five or six hundred times. In addition to that, in the materials processing area, we're thinking in terms of large crystal growth. Uh, gallium arsenide is one of the crystals which is mentioned, and that's uh, very highly effective for uh, for both solar cells and uh, and for uh, electronic chips. And so there are really a number of these things that are going to emerge, and I think with time we're going to see. Um, factories producing this stuff just in the same way as we take it for, for granted that we can uh, send television across satellites uh, without even thinking about it now. NASA has a long list of industrial processes it believes would work well on the station. Furnaces to make high purity crystals for super fast computer chips and improved fiber optics for the growing communications market. But so far only one process shows any real evidence of a commercial future. The manufacture of high value drugs. Charlie Walker is due to become the first non-astronaut in space when McDonnell Douglas sent him up on the shuttle to operate their new electrophoresis separation equipment. It's designed to separate a mixture of substances as they flow continuously through the machine, thus producing highly pure drugs in far greater quantities than on Earth. We're running um, six samples through the next couple days, and each sample is contained in a, in a syringe. The device is the latest in a series of prototypes flown at NASA's expense on earlier shuttle missions. As it's flowing up, um, we put an electric field on it across the, across the fluid, and that uh, separates the materials in the sample. But how real are the chances of making money on the space station? John Logston is a leading analyst of American space policy. He's recently advised the United States Senate investigating commercial opportunities in space. Of all the justifications being offered for the space station, the one that uh, I'm most skeptical about is the immediate commercial return. Uh, McDonnell Douglas has developed one process that seems to work well in space, but even that may be threatened by some ground-based uh, uh, alternatives. The cost of operating in space even with the station and, and the shuttle remains high and so you really need very high value uh, products uh, in order to justify operations in space and we just do not know what those products are even if the McDonnell Douglas experiment uh, succeeds and, and becomes a commercial product what's the second and third and fourth that one builds an industry on I think that that, that basic research hasn't been done the understanding hasn't been created that we're 20 years, perhaps, away from really knowing about the commercial potential of materials processing. It may work, but the notion that it will work in a time frame that justifies uh, spending 8 or $15 billion on a station in this century, I think, just is it's not realistic. Perhaps the real reason for the space station is more sinister. Certainly the shuttle has a military role. Top secret Department of Defense payloads will be carried on up to half of all future shuttle missions. And a special division of the Air Force, Space Command, has been created to militarize the new high ground. Space Command has its own mission control center and its own military shuttle crews. And soon, Space Command will have its own shuttle launch center a remarkable new space complex recently dedicated at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life we enjoy today, the privilege of living in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Guard and protect the astronauts who will fly from this spaceport, Slick 6. Amen. <laughs> Slick 
SpaceX, when it opens for business next year, will become the third manned spaceport on the planet. The vast mobile launch structures of Slick 6 represent a major military investment in space. From here, numerous early warning, communications and spy satellites will be launched. If President Reagan's Star Wars vision ever gets off the ground, then it will be from here. Yet as far as the space station is concerned, the Defence Department has gone out of its way to oppose its development. They repeatedly claim that their military objectives can be achieved perfectly well without it. The fact that the Defence Department is not a supporter of the space station I think is a bit peculiar in the sense that, that uh, they need not be as strong in their opposition as they have been. I think that's related to short-term politics, that, that uh, the current management of the Department of Defense seems to think that money spent on civilian space programs is money taken away from something they'd rather see done. Uh, I have little doubt that at some point in the future that the Defense Department will want to at least do some experiments on the station to see whether it's worth doing. Um, I, I do accept the notion that at this point it is a civilian enterprise. It's not a, a, a Trojan horse for a military interest. Uh, I, I think that, that that's an honest reality, uh, that the Defense Department at this point does not have any specific needs or justifications for permanent human presence in space. From a military point of view, the space station has many disadvantages. In wartime, it will be vulnerable to attack. And in peacetime, it will be in the full glare of the world's media. There could hardly be a worse place to conduct secret activities. So if the space station is neither a platform for the military, nor a profit-making factory in the sky, then what other uses may it have? Well, NASA believes it will also be a science park in space, a laboratory where scientists can continue and expand on the work now being done on Space Lab. Space Lab, Marshall Ops, Safe for all. Space Lab is a joint venture between NASA and the European Space Agency. It's a system of interchangeable manned and unmanned modules that fit in the cargo bay of the shuttle. On board Space Lab, in shirt sleeve conditions, scientists can gain immediate access to the unique environment of space. The only major restriction is the length of stay, limited by the relatively brief orbital endurance of the shuttle. Even so, the ease with which scientists can now work in space is a dramatic improvement over the early days of rocketry. James Van Allen was a pioneer in the earliest days of space science, and he is still a leading figure in the field today. How does he assess scientific possibilities on the space station? There's, there's no doubt that certain scientific uses of the space station can be identified, but on the whole, I expect the undertaking of the space station development to have a strongly adverse effect on the performance of space science and the advancements in space science by virtue of competition for resources, funds, and uh, launching facilities and matters of this sort. So I, I expect it to have an adverse effect. James Van Allen speaks for many scientists in America who fear that money spent on man in space is money lost to science. They argue that humans make poor experimenters. They're inefficient, disruptive, and they pollute the environment. Scientific experiments are much better carried out by robots. The performance of scientific experiments in a space station is extremely limited in scope and it's difficult to think of anything that can be well done in a space station which could not be better done by an unmanned commandable spacecraft. In 1986, the shuttle will place in orbit an unmanned commandable spacecraft that promises to be the most significant scientific instrument ever sent into space. The Hubble Space Telescope will see much further into the universe than has ever been possible before. Freed from the obscuring effects of the atmosphere, the optical system at the heart of the spacecraft will enable the telescope's mirror to resolve details ten times better than any instrument on the ground. But the space telescope itself will have no astronomers on board. Its revolutionary images will be relayed back to Earth to the Space Telescope Science Institute, destined to become the greatest observatory on Earth. In purely uh, numerical terms, is. Uh as big or bigger a, a leap than uh, occurred when Galileo uh, first used the telescope rather than the naked eye to look at the universe and look at stars. Now, it's not obvious how much of a leap that will bring in knowledge because the important 
advances are made where you not only see some objects better and better that you knew before, but when in some way this new capability you have brings about the discovery of new objects whose existence you could not previously suspect. We hope that that will happen with Space Telescope as well. We know for sure that every area of astronomy will be very profoundly affected. The Space Telescope is a perfect example of what can be achieved with an unmanned spacecraft. Yet it will also benefit from the presence of man in space, both to maintain its instruments and to carry out repairs if it breaks down. The facility to retrieve and service satellites in orbit is another advantage that NASA claims for the space station. They backed their claim earlier this year with a spectacular test using the shuttle. Challenger Houston through Hawaii and we've got a good picture of Pinky flying in the bank. The objective was to rescue and repair Solar Max, an ailing scientific satellite. Roger, copy that and the ground's giving you a go for the MMU flyover and the Fox. Okay, thank you. And I did get the chattering. Nelson on his way at one hour and two minutes. Unable to dock properly with Solar Max, Nelson tried instead to stop the satellite spinning with his hands. If you could uh, go in that hole somewhere like that, that'd be fine. I don't know if I'm going to have enough gas to do that. Okay, come on back in, thanks. I'm going to rape the satellite. They're fairly high, but come back to it. Challenger Houston for Crip. Stand by, Jerry. We're busy right now. I was just wondering if you'd like a station keep for another rev. Try the other MMU. Or we have to get another thing settled down. We'll talk to you about that in a minute. Nelson's efforts had only made Solar Max tumble faster, and for a while the mission seemed a failure. Happily, though, controllers on the ground managed to slow the spinning satellite, enough for the shuttle to maneuver alongside and attempt to grab Solar Max with a robot manipulator arm. Challenger Houston sending by through Yargity. Okay, we've got it, and we're... Roger, copy that. Outstanding. Challenger Houston, we see the rotation on TV, and we also see a smile on Don Murray's face. Challenger, the President of the United States. Hello, Bob. Well, once again, I'm calling to congratulate you and the rest of the crew aboard the Challenger there on an historic mission. But, uh, Bob, I understand that satellite you have on board would cost us about $200 million to build at today's prices. So, if you can't fix it up there, would you mind bringing it back? Roger, it's all downhill from here. Well, the repair of the Solar Max mission was a very impressive achievement, and I share in that pleasure of having seen that done. Now, on the economic side, though, it, it's not nearly as favorable. Uh, we could have made another SMM satellite and launched it for much less cost than the rescue mission uh, required. So economically, it was probably uh, not sensible to do. Perhaps the more important thing is of all the satellites in orbit around the Earth, or prospectively in orbit around the Earth, very few will be accessible to rescue by either the shuttle or the space or a space station. That beautiful sunrise. Right the there. successful repair of Solar Max was a convincing okay. demonstration of what man can do in space. But as an advertisement for the space station, it's misleading. The station may well become an orbiting garage and workshop. 
but at least for the foreseeable future, it will not have many customers. Blasting off from Florida, the shuttle will assemble the space station in the most economic orbit there is, a low equatorial orbit that takes full advantage of the extra boost provided by the Earth's spin. But most satellites are found elsewhere, many in polar orbit, ideal for surveying the ground. As the Earth turns on its axis, every part of the globe will, in due course, pass beneath the satellite's gaze. But polar orbit will be inaccessible to the space station. As will geostationary orbit, prime space real estate lying much further out than the low orbit where the space station will be. Out in geostationary orbit, a satellite circles the Earth exactly once a day, so maintaining a fixed position overhead. Geostationary orbit is the ideal location for the majority of the world's communication, navigation and weather observation satellites. But the space station, without a means to go up and get them, will be unable to rescue or repair a single one. NASA does have plans for a space ferry to fill this gap, but as yet no funds have been approved to build it. Launching satellites into this high orbit poses problems for the space station too. As with the shuttle, an extra booster fixed beneath the satellite is needed for the final part of the ride. Apart from the extra expense, these boosters have recently proved unreliable, encouraging potential customers to look elsewhere. As a means of launching satellites, Space Station will be facing some stiff competition. Unmanned expendable rockets like Europe's Ariane offer a less expensive means of launching satellites directly into geostationary orbit. And soon there will be another major competitor in the satellite launching business. Japan is investing heavily in space technology and is only waiting for America and Europe to tire of subsidizing launches with taxpayers' money before competing on a real commercial basis. So, the space station, America's next major goal in space, is being sold publicly on the basis of arguments that just don't stand up. The commercial prospects for industry in space are uncertain. The military appear uninterested. Many scientists are unconvinced. And as a means of launching and repairing satellites, there are some severe limitations. Perhaps the real reasons for building space station echo those that took America to the moon. The actors may be different, but the play is still the same. If we are to win the battle between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should both President Kennedy and Pre President Reagan aren't overwhelmingly concerned with economic or scientific benefits. If they come, fine. But they're making their decisions on the basis of the national interest of what's good for the United States, uh, of what will uh, present an image to the world of a nation moving forward at the forefront of technological accomplishment. That was true for Kennedy in May of 61. I think it's equally true for Reagan in 1984. <laughs> Both NASA and the President are keen to make the space station an international venture, at least with their closer allies. Cooperation in space is a political tool to strengthen alliances back on Earth. And America also has bitter memories of being left behind. The Soviet Union has had a space station, albeit a less ambitious one than NASA is now planning, in orbit for almost a decade. Their Salyut spacecraft have been occupied for up to six months at a time, and the Russians have played host to a variety of guests. I would like to ask a question to Comrade Leonid Kizim. 
about Rakesh Sharma. Does uh, Sharma snores while sleeping in Salute 7? And how does it affect the Salute 7 flight path, I would like to know. <laughs> so you don't know whether he is snoring or not, because both of you will be sleeping together, and simultaneously maybe. I suggest you ask this question of my wife. She'll be able to give you the answer. <laughs> Soviet space station technology is already well advanced. At one point earlier this year, there were six cosmonauts living on board Salyut 7, including Rakesh Sharma, the first Indian in space. And at the same time, but in a slightly different orbit, there were five American astronauts on board, or at least floating somewhere near, the shuttle. Eleven people together in space, the greatest number that has ever been at one time. No doubt this record will soon be broken, but it symbolizes the progress, uncertain at times, that we are making as we move out into space. Perhaps, after all, this vision is the true justification for the space station, even if it's not the one that NASA is promoting. NASA is a pretty conservative bureaucracy, and if you listen to everything NASA says, then, then things can get pretty dull. But really, the business that we're involved with has to do with the human renaissance in space. We're talking about mining the moon and the asteroids, creating huge space colonies, um, creating uh, solar power satellites to provide energy to the Earth. We're talking about people moving to the planets. Um, these are all things that sound rather astounding, but actually will probably happen around the turn of the century. And the space station provides a means by which we can start doing those things. And that's the real reason for a space station. Brian O'Leary sees the space station as the key to a rich future in space. A manned lunar base that, unlike Apollo, would establish a permanent foothold on the moon. Mining expeditions to extract precious metals from asteroids in orbit near Earth. And even one day soon, men and women on Mars. Setting foot on its surface to see with their own eyes a landscape first glimpsed by the Viking probes. I see the space station as the next step, sort of like the early days of aviation. I see sooner or later uh, low-cost, heavy-lift vehicles will, will lift uh, lots of people into space. First hundreds, later thousands, later millions of people. The space station then is, is a logical step, a stepping stone to our future. And so it's a very important step. It's the next logical step in the U.S. Uh, the Soviet Union is already doing it. and um, So although the space station itself is not the facility that you or I may, may be going to in 1992. By the late 1990s, I see many, many more people going up. In fact, well, right now, a ticket on the space shuttle, if there were a passenger uh, uh, thing aboard, would cost about a million dollars. That sounds like a lot of money, and of course, it's too much money for most of us. But there are a lot of people that would be willing to uh, afford the ride. But that's just for starters. Later on, uh, it, space travel will become available to more and more people as the costs go down and the demand goes up. Perhaps the space station should be justified not principally as a place to reap practical benefits, but as a challenge to our collective imagination. I, I think the uh, prospective space station does serve a cultural yearning. It has to, it's very closely related to uh, our interest in science fiction. It's a real thing. It's much less exciting than science fiction, but it is real. And that gives it a kind of a cultural appeal, which is undeniable. Now, I, I share in that. I think that, in fact, that may be the principal reason why we are engaged in the development of a space station with men on board, men and women on board. If it were just being done as an automated uh, spacecraft, it would not have that appeal at all, even though it might be a much better way to do things. But I think we should be honest about this, and if that is the reason, we should put it up front and say that is the principal reason, and then let us consider whether that's worthy of this kind of uh, undertaking or not.
Galileo, the last great planetary mission of the century. A mission to visit the moons and to sample the atmosphere of Jupiter. Two hundred days before Galileo reaches the planet, the probe detaches itself from the main spacecraft. And, flying briefly through the newly discovered rings, plunges into the atmosphere of Jupiter. It's saved from destruction by a heat shield which slows the probe down to the point where a parachute carries it gently down into the planet, radioing back data for an hour before it's crushed by the pressure. But as the probe's life ends, the orbiter's mission is just beginning. It first encounters the volcanic moon Io, returning images a thousand times clearer than those of Voyager. By using the gravity of Io to change its trajectory, Galileo places itself in orbit around the Jovian system. Over a two-year period, it will visit, in turn, each of Jupiter's principal moons. Using hardly any fuel, Galileo relies on precise calculations of orbital mechanics to achieve its exquisitely planned tour. There is probably a child now alive who will, one day, follow Galileo to Jupiter. That will be an adventure to equal the landing on the moon. Fifteen years ago, Buzz Aldrin was inside that spacesuit on the lunar surface. Well, looking back those fifteen years, uh... I see that as a great fulfillment of a commitment uh, that, that our nation made to an expanding, progressive, uh, outreaching movement. Uh, and, and I think we've all felt the uh, rejuvenation of our pride and spirit. And um, unfortunately, that, that faltered a bit. Uh, and I think that uh, what we're seeing now is a rejuvenation of that. And, uh, and I'd like to, s to think that, uh, that that spirit will be picked up again. Rather careful uh, to keep track of where your center of mass is. Would uh, get rather tiring after several hundred feet. But this may be a function of the suit as well as uh, lack of breath. Well, th th what comes to my mind now is, is, is a thought that I had quietly on a, on a lunar surface that um, the two of us were further away. Uh, than, than mankind had ever been before and in terms of the steps necessary to return back to home. And yet at the same time, we had uh, the sense and the feeling of, of uh, more people being with those, the two of us than had ever happened before. And I think that the spirit uh, of the people can carry with uh, future ventures. And, and, uh, and I guess uh, that that spirit of having the world with us and, and with the explorers, it's a great treat to be able to be a part of carrying those experiences back to, to all parts of the world. Like Apollo, the decision to develop the space station will determine the course of the American space program for at least a decade. But the space station is not being sold, like Apollo, as a visionary adventure. Instead, it's supposed to provide profit and practical benefit. NASA is afraid that without down-to-earth justifications, the whole manned space program, like this unused Saturn V moon rocket, could end up as a museum piece. 
if the space station is not to be like Apollo, a giant leap to nowhere, then surely it must be unashamedly presented for what it is. A stepping stone to a viable future in space. And yes, a reason for NASA to go on existing. Expensive? Maybe. But the only project likely to capture the public imagination enough to keep the funds for space exploration coming in. No grand and ultimately fruitless adventure, but the first real step on our journey outward, beyond the moon. downhill from here.